it worked. Now we'll make this work. Can you hear me? Everything's working. So I'm here tonight to talk about Apache Drill. And Apache Drill is a very new project. It just graduated from being days old to being weeks old. So that kind of new. That said, it's got a lot of interest. We have hundreds of people on the mailing list. We have several hundred people that have joined the Bay Area Apache Drill Users Group. Users is kind of premature, uh, but very exciting. We've had a contribution from Google. Google contributed the name. That was their suggestion. And uh, other groups, there's a group in Israel who flew somebody out for the first users group in the Bay Area. They're contributing a Dremel compatible parser. There's another group who has a, an advanced uh, query and optimizer that they're throwing into the mix. Uh, and uh, then there's some execution engines <coughs> as well. So it's coming together very, very fast. Uh, it does not at this time, however, work. So a you know, minor feature to be added shortly. And I'll give a, a bit of a talk at the end, a bit more extempore than the slideshow. Uh, to talk about how we're making this thing work, how we're gluing these pieces together, what the vision is, what some of the gotchas are. So people who know SQL well, when they start looking at Dremel, see some real big surprises. So we'll talk a little bit about that toward the end. Uh, I, I don't know if I need to say this in Chicago because I've been here a fair bit lately. My background is startups, open source, startups uh, since uh, continuously pretty much since the mid-90s, uh, some pretty good ones, uh, some very exciting ones. Music Match is just an awesome company. Uh, half the company had worked in food service, another half had worked in music, and that meant we had lots of parties. Uh, I've been doing big data since before big was invented. Uh, back in the, the late 80s and early 90s, I was doing a lot of, of uh, linguistics for people who had big data back then, kind of secretive folks. And then all of these startups involved big data in one form or another. Veo was the first one where I started with Hadoop and was uh, lucky enough to buy the beer at the first hub. We had 35 people and they were too distracted to drink anything. It was an average of $4 per person for a four hour meeting. That was all the beer and appetizers they would eat. Uh, I've since then become fairly active in, in Apache uh, with Mahout and Zookeeper and now Drill. Uh, they keep mentioning every time Datamare does a demo that I'm still the most active person on the Hadoop mailing list, even though I haven't posted there in probably two years. Uh, so I was very active with Hadoop at, at one point, much less so now, more in the ecosystem. I'm now at MapR as Chief Application Architect and a founding member of Apache Drill, which is where we're going tonight. Uh, MapR Technologies, just for a quick thing before I take the hat off. We make a Hadoop distribution which has a number of interesting properties. Uh, it combines proprietary technology with open source, probably more open source in it than any other distribution because we bring in things like uh, cascading and such. Uh, and we, we try to enable things uh, that are just not possible, we open things up a bit wider. Now, about drill, and back into Apache mode, I need a feather, I guess. Uh, to make it authentic. The, uh, the, the point of drill is to do ad hoc analysis of fairly large volumes of data. And the ad hoc analysis that's going to be done here is a full table scan of some sort of data without full general joins. And so this is uh, something that is less capable than what MapReduce could do. But the trade is we're going to try to make it much faster so that we can support things like real-time dashboards. So we can support things like ad hoc analysis of data, where you want to try this, do you want to try that, you want to fiddle with this, you want to fiddle with that, you want to qualify your data a different way. And the idea there is that we want query times to be from hundreds of milliseconds to tens of seconds. And as everybody tends to know fairly early on in using Hadoop, ordinary Hadoop especially, uh, in 20 seconds, that's how long it takes to do nothing in, in Hadoop, much less try to do something. So we're going to try to investigate a new regime of operation. And as we see it, there's, um, that one's just oddly colored, that's just the point is. 
Uh, it's, it's the alignment now, it's just, it is what it is. Okay, so the idea here is that the open source ecosystem has replicated to some degree what Google has done. In the batch processing, Hadoop replicates, reinvents what MapReduce does at Google. On the real-time side, there is no well-known outside of Google equivalent, but things like Storm and S4 do honest-to-God real-time. Now, the trade-off between real-time and batch in this sort of world is that you have to know your, your queries ahead of time. You have to compile them into your code to do the real-time analysis. Whereas with MapReduce, you have the flexibility to re rewrite your program at any given time and rerun it. So there's a flexibility there. But the real-time part has that forced pre-compilation. And so trying to mix the quickness of the real-time, not exactly real-time, but certainly interactive, with the flexibility of MapReduce leads you to what at Google is Dremel and what in the open source world is this big hole. We have a hole right here in the open source world where we just don't do what's a very natural middle ground where you have queries, you want to do a, basically a full table scan, you want to work against maybe terabytes of data, not do general joints, do reporting sort of queries, aggregations. And so that's where Drill is targeted. That empty hole in the open source ecosystem is what we're after. And if you think about what makes open source valuable, and my, my thinking on this has changed over the years, but it, it occurs to me that the projects I've been involved in that really, really worked follow this idea. And this is an old Apache saying, and that is community over code. And people go, ah, no, 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 it's the code. But it really isn't. The thing that's made Hadoop really work is the community, the consensus about APIs that we have in this. That, that defines the community. It's the community of people who code to essentially the same APIs. That's what defines Hadoop as a community. And exactly how that's implemented is far, far less important. In fact, it's important to have diversity in how these things are coded to keep the progress moving. But if Yahoo and LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and a few other companies had all gone separate ways, we wouldn't have anything, or not even beer tonight, which is the result of community, because all of them would be incompatible. They would have this little tiny developer community. They wouldn't be able to hire people who knew their internal processes. And the whole world, in terms of large-scale computing, would be much, much less rich. It's that consensus that's driven the, the actual history. And so consensus and community is what needs to be built when we have a big, empty hole like Drill is trying to fill. And so the first thing here is to build the community, not just <coughs> paratroop a massive load of code onto the community, and ram a particular API down their throats, but to build community, to build consensus, so that we have the kind of community that we have at Hadoop in this regime of operation. So that's the strategy that we decided on when we said, let's make Drill happen. So we canvassed some of our old friends, Grant Ingersoll, who's a stalwart from Lucene, he's a founder of the Mahout, uh, uh, Apache project. He was a very early proponent of Hadoop and Nutch uh, becoming what they are. And uh, Isabel Drost, who was a founding member of Mahout as well, and I am the Apache champion. With three or four, I'm not sure how many companies, uh, Drawn to Scale, Concurrent Processing, the guys who did Cascading, and MapR, devoted some resources to, to launch this. And since then, we've had half a dozen, a dozen other companies jump on and say they want to contribute a lot. Uh, this company in, in Israel that I was talking about, Big Data Crowd, says that they have five developers they want to put on this. Uh, Intel says they have one to three people they want to put on it. MapR has something, LinkedIn is beginning to, to kick in. Uh, we're getting interest from just a wide variety of companies that this really, really is something that is needed in the community and they want to make the community happen. 
That said, it, it is all as as you know, history repeating itself, based in its first vision, very much on a Google project. Google has something called Dremel, and the idea there is Dremel's the the, the power tool, the, the not very powerful power tool, is something that depends on inertia rather than torque. And so it wants to go fast in order to get results with a little tiny blade, as opposed to something like a drill press or you know a, a big mill or something like that, which depends on torque and power to do what it is. And so Dremel was this idea this would be something that does very fast operations, but in a limited way. And so Dremel allows the interactive analysis of large scale and, and these are pretty dang large scale. There's multi-terabyte uh, systems. These are trillions of records at a time. Uh, they allow these an, uh, analyses to be done in, in an interactive time scale, not real time, interactive. And that means less than a few tens of seconds is, is the time scale that these work in. And they're complementary to MapReduce because in order to get that speed, the semantics of drill, Dremel, excuse me, uh, are limited. It does not, did not originally do any joins at all. All it would do is scan through a column formatted data table, one table, whip it through that, doing aggregations on nested data in various ways, really fast. Now, since then, they've added the cap capability to do what I tend to call pejoratively baby joins where the, the right-hand table in the join can be up to eight megabytes total size, period, end of story. And that means that you can broadcast that table to every worker in the cloud, and they can do it in memory, what would be a map side join in MapReduce. But this is a very, very limited data processing model. It's fine for reporting tables. It's fine for saying, well, how many of this kind of download do we get? How many of that kind? Can we group them by day? Can we group them by city? And then can we do sub-aggregation on time? Things like that, which are just exactly what you want to do for visualization. Now, you do need to do big joins and things like that as well, which is why it's complementary to MapReduce, where you can do these big operations. And maybe someday it would do it, but long, long ways away. So the key model here is different from SQL. They, they picked a, a syntax, which looks a lot like SQL, but they picked a data structure which is very different from SQL. SQL has rows in a relation. And even if you have nested collections where one of the fields in a row can be a collection in and of itself, it is still rows in a relation. And that's a fundamental concept in SQL. Here we have something very different. What we have is a forest of trees, where before we had records, we now have a tree of data. And each subtree is keyed by a, a key, and then that can have subtrees, and those can have subtrees. And so when we do selection, we pick some parameter that no sort of condition that has to match, and only subtrees that have some leaf down below or subtree down below that matches that condition. Only those will survive the selection and all the way up. And then we can iterate, we can, uh, we can aggregate over the results of that selection. But it's a different animal. And if, if you start looking at the, the discussion on the mailing list today, the, the, the semantic mismatch between what SQL is and what drill is becomes apparent. It's a very different thing. But it was a really, really good idea to make this change in semantics because it matches so much of what we want to do on denormalized big data sort of assets. The implementation at Google involved a fast column-based storage idea, and, and it, it does some of the standard database things, which include late assembly of records. So it will do filtering directly on a compressed column, and it, it, it even does push down of query filtering into the compressor, decompressor. So it'll do the, 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 the filtering on the compressed representation without even decompressing it, much less serializing. 
And then those pieces that get filtered that way get bubbled up. And as we get all of the pieces from individual columns, glue those together, and then later we add in the other columns. And so the idea here is that we can just scan through very, very heavily compressed a few rows to do the selection, and then pick up just a few more rows to do the reporting or aggregation, or columns, excuse me. And we can therefore pass through very wide data at very high speed because we're only looking at very narrow bits of it, and we're not even decompressing a lot of it. And so that tree architecture applies to the data, but it also applies to how it's implemented. They have workers that report to other workers that report to the original source of the query. Google's big query is the software as a service, or as I accidentally often say, I've said twice today, service as a service is, is what I tend to call it. But it's software as a service, and it has both a command line interface and a web UI, an Ajax sort of interface, and it looks just the same sort of Spartan thing you would expect from Google. You type in your query, and you see your data. And there's a go button. Hey, what more do you need, right? Uh, what are you complaining about? You have wheels on this car. Uh, why do you need a gear shift? But anyway, it, it's, it's a system that requires a schema definition. Uh, for BigQuery, the data has to be in a CSV format, not this tree nested data, except for the data sets that they already have. That limitation is probably mostly product management more than actual capabilities. So that's where Dremel stands. Apache Drill is in contrast, as I said, still quite formative. The architecture that is pretty much a consensus, both in discussions in face-to-face -face and on the mailing list, is that we want to decompose the architecture into multiple <coughs> API injection points. So you have a driver. Now the driver might be a JDBC or an ODC driver. It might be a command line REPL, a re read eval print loop. It might be an AJAX interface, but it's some way of injecting queries in, a, in an original language into the system. That's the first thing. Drive. And at that point, we have textual queries in a language to be determined. And we feel that it's important to have multiple languages at that point, because it would be so nice if this capability were glued into, say, Hive, or glued into Pig, or if some SQL generation system like Excel could use it. Now, SQL is not the same as Drill, QL, not the same as Dremel. And so a system that generates SQL probably won't generate valid Drill, QL. And so you probably need at least four syntaxes all the way, at least. And you probably even want kind of an abstractor syntax so that programs can manipulate these queries easily. That would be nice. It's a more machine tractable format. There's a parser then that converts that to an internal representation, essentially an abstract syntax tree. And again, we probably need multiple parsers at multiple phases of this driver structure. And we want to inject also after the parser. There's two reasons for that. One is we want to test parsers. If somebody comes up with a new parser and they translate the, the standard queries into their language, they want to be able to see that the result is equivalent to the standard results. It makes sense for testing. It also makes sense that that's probably a good injection point for programmatic access. It also makes sense that if the pig team wants to support drill, they'd probably rather control their parser and inject an abstract syntax tree into drill rather than have the pig parser be part of the drill project. So in, in terms of project governance, it's good to have the flexibility. We also then need a compiler because any system like this, the actual query that you give it is probably a long ways away from the query as you want it to execute. At the very least, there are many machines you want to execute on and you have to decide <coughs> which machine will do which work. You also have to decide which scanner is going to be given certain tasks. Can you do push down into that scanner? Can, how are you going to combine it? Where are you going to do the late record assembly? And so on. So you need a physical plan, which is what the compiler will produce. Again, textual, because it's very nice, at least for testing, to both be able to observe the physical plan and to inject at that point. And finally, we need a 
storage, or I mean, uh, an execution engine, which compiles the actual code that's given to it, like scan this piece of a file with this query. Don't worry about aggregation, just send the results back to this other machine. That's the level of, of specification that that thing's going to receive. But it may itself want to do query optimization, possibly compilation down in native code. So again, we need another execution engine that, that does abstract things there. And finally, we need an API that talks to multiple kinds of storage. It's quite clear somebody's going to want HDFS. Some of us, I'll put the hat back on if I have to, will want MapRFS. Some people would like local files. I think this would make a, an awesome awk replacement running on my local laptop just against local files. That would be great fun to have. And so we have lots of storage engines that need to be supported, or at least supportable. Even if the drill community doesn't do it, if somebody else has something brilliant that they want to do this against, they should be able to drive it. Uh, there was a lot of interest in Boston last week from the head out guys, the, the, their chief scientist was there, and he saw this, and we explained some of the internals of how we're talking about doing query optimization, and he was just going, yes, yes, yes. They really, really want to be able to plug into a standard architecture like this so that they can kickstart their own capabilities. Just to make it a little bit more clear, <coughs> here are a couple of different architectural arrangements. So we might have a DRQL client there, and that would be something that's, say, reading from the command line, and, and it's got just a driver, and it drives it into a standard parser. Or we might have something like a pig client, which has a driver of its own, which drives it into its own intermediate parser, and then comes in with an abstract language parser there. Then we, they all go through the same query optimizer and go off to drill workers that have execution engines. That's a, a classic sort of architecture with this sort of thing. Inside the, the execution engine, it, it's very clear from the experience that a lot of these members have that we need an encapsulated and abstracted uh, execution level represented by these square blocks, wherein the communication between the square blocks is in terms of relatively opaque blobs. And the square blocks would be execution frameworks into which we would inject queries in the form of tag, processing tags. But then inside that execution framework, they would be entirely free to restate that query as necessary. Possibly, as I said, going to uh, low level language. And also, they would handle the uh, entry and egress of data. So interior, it might be viewed as a micro column sort, or it might be viewed as a sequence of records, depending on what sort of square box we put around it, what sort of round blobs we put inside. But as it leaves, it has to go back out as an agreed upon kind of blob. So this is a common architecture. This is used in SQL Server 2012. It's used in a variety of databases where this aggregation type query is done. And it allows a lot of flexibility in these execution engines that can then lead to a lot of quick results in terms of getting product out, but also some very, very fast execution engines later on. We want to support flexibility in the data flow. If you inject data at the top, we need to be able to supply not just Dremel formatted files, the yellow path on the right, but we'd also like to have row-based formats. That's, that's kind of the awk use case, where you want a massive parallel awk against data that's already there. You don't want to convert it to anything else. You want to work in C2, and you're willing to take a 10 or 20x hit on speed just because it's right there, and let's do it. Or even if it's on your own machine, you may not want to convert it to a special format. So we want to have that left-hand side, that left-hand data path. And we don't like to allow that left-hand data path to also cause a drill load, uh, a side effect of the processing, to create a column-based format. Then in the, in the oval area, we need to have row-based processing and column-based processing, interchangeable, depending on what the data sources are. And then finally, at the bottom, we want to have a variety of, of query languages, SQL, DRSQL, Hive, Pig, Mongo query language even is, is a fine candidate. And we'd like to leave it open 
for anybody in any bright spark who has a good idea about a query syntax to go for it without having to have expertise throughout the whole data chain. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the, the data is nested, and so the query language has to be nested. And that leads to some interesting things. Uh, Mongo does it in its particular way, but uh, let's see, do I have a, yeah, here's a better example. Uh, in, uh, in Avro, for instance, you may have an IDL which describes users, which include other structures. Or in JSON, you might have things like this. So you have nested data records like that, and elements of those records can be in themselves nested data structures, or even possibly arrays of nested data structures. Think of it as JSON on steroids. By the way, our, our, our architect on this, his name is Jason Franz. I only twigged to that last week, but that's why he likes the JSON format so much. Because it was named for him, he says. So, go ahead, yeah. Is there any reason why protocol buffers are going to ultimately show up in this? So he asked why protocol buffers are going to show up in this. So the, the, at the first level, there needs to be a reasonable wire format that's future-proof between components in order to define the API. The sense of the community is that there are basically two, maybe three alternatives there. Thrift, Avro, and protocol buffers. And in looking at the experience that people have had and the evaluations people have had, it really looked preferable to use protocol buffers. But the, the really key decision point there <coughs> is that it was very much the sense of the community that it's very important for us to have consensus on one of those and drive forward on that for our internal wire format. There are no absolutely killer differences between them, except perhaps against Thrift, in that the protocols that are available for wire serialization are very subject uh, to strangeness when they're corrupted. So you can have hanging servers on malformed queries. So it kind of leaves it to Avro and Protobufs. More of the developers have experience with Protobufs than with Avro, and so that's where it went. Now what, I'll get to you, Horace, in just a sec. Uh, he seems so excited about his question. Uh, he's always excited, uh, excitable kind of guy. So whether or not Avro or Protobufs or Thrift or anything else is used as the actual end user data format is another question entirely. So if you have data in any format, it should be easy to plug into this system. That's a requirement. But the internal formats for our own APIs inside of Drill are very, very, very likely to be Protobufs. You know, we've had informal votes and, and the, it was dominant. Consension, pretty close to consensus that protobufs were the way to go for us. Yeah, so the thing that seems to me is with uh, Doug Cutting adding the protobuf reader and writer capability to Avro, is that if it was using Avro in there with the protobuf reader and writer capability to be plugged in as part of that API, then you could effectively jack in to any point in there and decouple it with your own testing. Theoretically, I think that, so he mentions that the, the, the protobuf reader and writer capability is available in Avro. Um, theoretically, that's true. Um, again, most of our developers have experience in protobufs. Uh, very few have experience in Avro. There are always gotchas in serialization formats, and we just feel that protobufs is a bit more tried and true. There's certainly a lot of experience in the Hadoop community now that Hadoop uh, RPC is based on protobufs. And MapR is entirely based on protobufs. <coughs> Mesos is on protobufs. You know, it's just, it's everywhere. And Avro certainly had a chance to become the standard because it was out there available before protobufs was. And it has some attractive characteristics, but it just doesn't have quite as much momentum. And it doesn't have as nice a uh, description, documentation, it's easier to spin people up. It doesn't pass my own 45-minute test. I've tried a couple times. Can I get started with Avro and actually do something useful in 45 minutes or less? No, not generally. And I can't with Protobus. That's another aspect. So it's the, the, the consensus was threefold. One, we had to have one standard. 
Two, the differences between them were not huge. Thrift was the only one that had a significant black mark on it. And three, the developers had more experience. So out of those, let's just go, go forward. Yeah, of course, yeah, I promise. Yeah, it's pretty much on the place, and because both J. Mike and me and I be ever fans. I, I, and it looks like if you listen to Calavera, operate in the future, if you listen to everybody else. Yeah, and I wouldn't put my thumb down for Avro. Like this? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's just that every time I successfully used it, I had to call Doug Cunning. And, uh, well, I mean, like I put it into Pluto. You're going to borrow a couple of developers from what? They're pretty good than that. You want my yeah. April check first? But, but you see what I'm saying is, is, is the level of awareness and easy of use in the startup phase was just difficult for me. And that was what made me reasonably happy going with Protobuffs. Uh, but again, the differences are not huge. I do like the fact that with Protobuffs, you can light up a, a Python program and inspect data. That's pretty cool. And I think we should definitely support data assets as our Because otherwise, we don't get you guys as users, right? But that's different from an internal wire format. Wire format has to have consensus. File formats have to have everything. It's just the opposite. So there, but there wasn't any concern with the backward compatibility as the protocols perhaps evolved? So the question is about backward compatibility. Uh, Protobuffs has been through many generations, far more backward compatibility in a demonstrated production setting than ever has. Google's been using Protobuffs essentially since 2001, I think, internally. And a lot of our guys are ex-Google. And they've seen how to make Protobuffs survive over very long periods of time. Many, many, many revisions, more than any uh, open source program has had. And so, no, the concern is exactly the other way, that Avro really doesn't have as much road time on it for future proofing. Now, on the other hand, Doug's a cool guy, highly respected, but again, Google is, yeah, he's tall too, I mean, you can't argue with that. Uh, but Google's also pretty dang good at this. And so I think we're seeing a very mature thing and a possibly mature thing. And again, for the wire protocol, there were no strong other ways other than prejudice, literally prejudged by these developers. And the feeling was consensus was very important. So we closed that down, made a consensus, and at the same time said, in file data formats, it's very important to support everything. So that's the way it came down. Here's a sample. And some of the things here that are interesting are, for instance, you see the multiple dots, um, name.language.code. So in these records that we're looking at from the table T, it's nicely named. We obviously have a name, and it's, these are web page sort of things. So every web page has a URL. And internally, it has a language data structure, and it probably has multiple language data structures. <laughs> And so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to count the different values of language.code within these different pages within each page. So within the set of languages for each page, we're going to count within that. It's a thing that you really don't do much in SQL without nested collections. And we're going to return uh, pieces of the deep structure and the top structure, we're going to take, retain the doc ID, the count, we're also going to uh, retain the name.url and name.image.code. So we're going to mix layers out of this data as well. And we're going to do it for things where the regex matches on the main URL. And we're going to do it just for a few doc IDs. So that's an example of how we can drill into the best, sorry, so we can penetrate into deeply nested structures, which had made it worked. Maybe arrays of nested structures in a Dremel port. The general components of this are, as you'd expect, select from where, group by, having. And then there are very limited joints, baby joints, as I mentioned, where the right side has to be tiny, the left side can be huge. And with these components and restrictions, we can do all queries by a single scan 
across the envelope. And that's a big deal. That's what makes this, we, 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 try, we give up power in return for speed with this design. And then there are key logical operators to which these, from which these <coughs> queries will be compiled into. Scan, filter, aggregate, join. And these will then be glued together in a processing DAG in a, in a multiple data flow style to get the results we want. In terms of extensibility, we'd like to have pluggable query languages. Right off the bat, people have said Dremel equivalent has to be there. They've said Mongo query language is really cool. It'd be very nice to have uh, domain specific languages that describe data manipulation, like cascading, to be supported. Chris Wenzel really wants to support that. And his vision is that you could have a large cascading flow, portions of which are executed by drill, portions by MapReduce. And so it would mix and match as it went. And that same sort of vision is what we would imagine that PIG and Hive communities would also like. Uh, distributed execution engine, it's uh, very important to have extensibility along the lines of, say, the original Dryad paper, which was a very long time ago in terms of evolution. We want to have low latency and fault tolerance at that level. Nested data formats are where this is all about, both in terms of column-based data structures and row-based data structures. Row-based data structures like Avro or, or even the raw protobus are going to be slow but they're very important. And we want to have multiple kinds of schema and schemaless data. And then, of course, many data sources. The scan operators work by hand delegating to the data source itself and pulling back any predicates that need to be evaluated above the data source level, but pushing down those in, into the data source. And the way that this goes from the abstract syntax query to this very, very concrete format is via the query optimizer. The, the system that we're likely to be using is one called Optique. And what it does is it takes a DAG, which is the query, the original query, and it defines transformations on this DAG, on subtrees of the DAG. And those, those subgraphs can be translated to new forms in many different ways, and it's order specific. You could do one transformation here, and then that might enable another transformation that overlaps with it. And overall, the end product must be not in the original abstract syntax, but must be expressed entirely in the concrete syntax. It must also have no bare nodes, which are filters and predicates and things like that. Everything must be wrapped by a physical execution layer predicate, which is a higher order function. So all of these transformations are explored inside the query optimizer until it comes down to something that meets the minimum requirements, that it's executable. And then it explores to find optimal uh, execution time versions of that plan. So for instance, one of the things it might pick is which execution engines work on which data elements. It would obviously like to maximize data locality, it would like to maximize balance. If it has statistics about data sets, it would like to do reasonable splits so that we get uh, good properties in the presence of skew, things like that. So it's going to be doing an evolutionary modification and tree rewriting until it gets to an executable form of that query, which is in the format that's necessary in terms of these functions which say, I'm going to scan JSON I'm going to do column I.O. or record I.O. and in the proper formats and then inject into those the actual functions to be evaluated, predicates and aggregates. The design parameters that we want to pick, I mean, three of them are easy for uh, MapR people to remember, easy, dependable, fast, because that's our mantra. And we want to add flexible. We need pluggability everywhere. You need to be able to plug in at different points. You need to be able to substitute components. But we also want to, this to be radically easy. We want as much as possible, zero conf, the ability to run many platforms in very many configurations, from sequential on one thread on one machine, to many threads on one machine, to many machines with many threads on many machines. Uh, we also want it to be highly dependable, no single point of failure. We learned that lesson from the original Duke. We don't want to repeat that history. 
instant recovery from crashes should just keep on going if pieces fall off. And we want it fast. We want to be flexible between very fast, low-level processing C++ with uh, just-in-time compilers, things like that, and very fast development with Java. We need to have all of these API points be language change allowance points. <coughs> so the first query analyzer and optimizer looks like it'll be in Java. The very first uh, storage engines are likely to be in Java, but very shortly after that, storage engines are likely to become C. So we need that flexibility so that we can have that, that high speed and that high throughput in terms of development. We want to, in every case, reach speeds that are limited only by hardware. We want to integrate strongly with Hadoop, strongly with resource schedulers like Yarn, but not exclusively with these capabilities. And so before we go into any deeper details, if, and that's up to you guys, I'd like to invite everybody here to get involved. It's easy to do, subscribe to the mailing list, uh, come to, well, you can download these slides. These are being given tonight, very nearly, uh, exactly, by Jason at the Bay Area Hub, so you can grab his slides, which will say Jason Brands at the beginning, instead of me. Uh, join the project, uh, subscribe to the mailing list, uh, ping me, I, I can be grabbed in a lot of different ways directly, personal email, Apache email, MapR email, on Twitter, just all kinds of different ways. Uh, and by the way, we also are soliciting people to come work for us on this and other exciting projects. So, do we have any questions? And I just wanted to inject that we have a couple of optional topics. I can talk in more detail about query optimizers. I can talk in more detail about compressed data transformations, about how JITs might be applied to Query and execution. Uh, I think that all told, we probably have five hours of stuff to talk about that are optional and probably not all interesting. So, questions? Where would you like to go? Yeah, Boris again. One thing that I've never talked about is data locality. Is it So, Boris asks about data locality. And I, I mentioned that in passing, but that is a function of the original query planner, the query optimizer, it will score certain execution plans poorly if they have poor locality. So, so the, uh, the execution planner has the incoming query, it has a vocabulary of concepts that it's allowed as input, a vocabulary of transformations, and a required vocabulary of executable uh, properties. But it also has a scoring function. And the scoring function will penalize plans that involve non-local I.O. And so the magic of Optique, which is an evolutionary optimizer for query plans, is that it will be able to schedule mostly local I.O. in a more general way than Hadoop currently does. Yeah? You want to pull some cons versus a relational database. You want to be controversial. <laughs> no, okay. And also, also what's, how do you actually make able to access the data so quickly? What's, uh, how, does it use a B tree or what? Well, it doesn't use a B tree, but how do you actually be able to access and, and process the data that way? Okay, so the question is how, how is this going to be go so fast? Yeah. How does Dremel, in, in the working example, process a terabyte in 20, 30 right. seconds? Right. Because doing the math, that's like 30 gigabytes per second. That's really fast. Yeah. And uh, the way it works, is that uh, in a weak schema sort of world, or a nested schema sort of world, where you have these tree-oriented data structures, what you can do is you can enumerate all of the possible nested labels on any data item. So you know you might have a page, a, a web page, and it might have a URL. So web page dot URL. And it might have links to this page from other pages. And links to would be an array of references. And they would be web pages that it's linking from, which is probably URL, and a little bit of link text. So it would be an array of things. And so we would have uh, web page dot link from dot URL and dot uh, uh, link text. And we would also have web page links to 
and they would have similar properties, except the URL would mean something different. So we have this vocabulary of all of the nested possible names for any data in our data, in any data element in our data set. Make sense? And you can imagine if you have BSON data, you could just scan the data and look for every nesting that appears. Now every one of those can be a column and a fairly standard columnar sort of arrangement. So every time we see a webpage.url, we'll put that in the webpage.url column. Every time we see a webpage.linkfrom.url, we'll put it in that column. We might have many of those elements in that column for one tree in the parent. In fact, we may have a little uh, half back to the root. And, and what we wind up with then looks very, very much like a star schema without the fact table. In a star schema, you have the fact table, which basically has keys of dimensions. And then you have these dimension tables, which sometimes have references from the fact table and sometimes do not. Like this employee was referenced in these transactions and so on. And so what we wind up having to do here is this denormalized dimension table with no fact table. What we have is links that go back to a virtual fact table, say this is in record so and so, this tree such and so, or this is tree number, sub tree number two, sub tree number three of this particular tree in the input. So it's, it's reversed like that. So it, it, the column oriented data structure implicitly is very much like a star schema. Now if I'm going to do an analysis on the web. And I want to know how many links are there going to each page on average. Four pages that are within a particular domain. So I would be doing webpage.url matches this domain, begins with sort of thing. And we would only have to look at that one column. And almost everything will not match that domain. That's just the nature of the web. And so I would only look at that column for almost all data elements. And I might get a match, and now I know which tree that's in, and I can now skip in these other columns, the link to column, and I can do a quick count of how many of those are. I don't have to decode those at all. I just have to look at how many elements there are there. Now, if there are 100 other columns, I never read those. So I could easily have a terabyte of data that I skip through in a very clever way, not deserializing it as I would in a row format, only looking at the columns that matter. And the compression on columns could be quite high, 10x, 20x. The filter predicate could go actually inside that decompressor. So I never even decompress the column that I'm looking at on the things I don't want to see. And so you can wind up, you see how you could easily get 100x speed up. And we said 30 gigabytes per second to go through a, a terabyte in <coughs> 30 seconds, that sort of thing. If we get 10x, we're talking about 3 gigabytes per second. If we get 100x, we're talking about 0.3 gigabytes per second. Well, that's quite imaginable on a few machines. So that's, that's how this is done. This columnar database, the implicit star schema, and push down through those layers so we do not do record assembly if we can possibly help That's how that works. I'm not going to, your, your last name will be again soon. Uh, hello. So is there a substantial pre-population <coughs> before those trees are actually identified and set up? Uh, that, the question is, is there a pre-population cost? Uh, there's a cost of scanning the data in order to convert it to this format. That is a cost. And the thought is that, um, one, you may never want to do that, because you may be happy just scanning it. It may not be one terabyte, it might be 10 gigabytes. Eh, let's just scan it. Uh, it might also be possible to do a technique called uh, database cracking, so that the first time you query any file, and my file might be just for the last 15 minutes, not for last year, you would magically, and as a side effect, cache a column-oriented form of that file. So the first query over 15 minutes, which is a small amount of data, would be slow-ish. But from then on, queries against all of the data, or today's data, would be column-oriented. So database cracking can hide that cost. 
and we do it incrementally then. Or we can cache higher level things, either materialized expressions or other things as virtual columns as well. So database cracking and caching are critical concepts to hiding that cost. Or we just say part of our data flow is we get 15 minutes of data, this is an appendment to a file, and we're going to just go ahead and columnize that amount of data. And we just do it as a penalty that we do, we pay over time. But we don't have to do it more than once. And we don't actually have to do it ever. So it is probably a big deal. It seems like a big deal. Probably isn't really. It's much less costly than loading into a database. Should run at disk speeds on input, and the output should be heavily compressed. And so the input side should talk. Yeah. Along with that question, like this approach is for statistic analysis only, or we also support like transactional data, uh, transactional operation. Uh, the question is: Is this for statistical analysis only, or do we support transactions? Well, I wouldn't say statistical analysis. I would say any kind of retrospective aggregation or scanning. But inherent in the definition here, no updates. So I could claim that they're all transactional because there are none. <laughs> so we adhere to trivial semantics. But no, there are no updates. If you want to do updates, you do that outside the framework. Maybe you put down a parallel update tree and, and so that there's uh, uh, an update column that you might scan in parallel. So you might be able to have implicitly in a data thing is if you, you can say web page dot something or web page dot new version dot something. And so you might be able to do tricks like that. Or you may be able to use HBase or other NoSQL inputs as, as your data. There's a lot of different tricks that you could apply. Or you could build a columnar specialized update, a Delta processor as a scanner. So there's a lot of tricks you could do, because you only have to store the things that change. And you would not change the original data, just store the deltas. And so that should be able to scan the deltas very fast. Yeah. So um, I read the, the journal paper. Some of the details made my head hurt. Um, one of the things that, that I noticed was that it seems to go back to uh, some of the concepts that we see in SQL databases, right? The, the SQL syntax. Um, and you know, table scans though instead of indexes. Uh, one of the things that occurs to me, and I, I didn't see this in the paper, can some of the traditional techniques like partitioning um, be used and, and will they be supported in the drill to improve performance? Absolutely. The question is will we do traditional duh techniques from 20 years ago from databases? And, and there's a lot of hints about <coughs> good ways of doing that. One of the interesting properties, however, is that a lot of the technology in database is oriented around update. Like a huge fraction of the literature is how do we do this in the presence of updates? Well, cut that away. Okay. How do we do this in the presence of large joins? Cut that away. How do we do this in the presence of single table scan? Got that. And how do we do this? on small chunks of a single table scan. So a lot of the cleverness in table scans has to do not so much as with joints, but there are key skew sort of problems. But on any small piece of a large table, these skew problems are far, far less. It's the piecewise linear sort of approximation. To the and so you can do uh, statistical estimation on the properties of the table at the micro level that you cannot do, in general, at the macro level. The first query planner does not have the specific statistics available to do that down there. And so instead of indexing, it's probably worthwhile to do like one disk rotation of data, about a megabyte, and to have high-low indicators on a lot of fields. That alone will give us almost all of the benefit of, a, uh, of an index and yet it will give it to us in a very, very adaptive way. And since we know that these are tiny, tiny, tiny little pieces, we know that they'll probably be pretty uniform within that range. So we can do tricks like that, which give us many of those effects, but we can do them in ways that could not reasonably be done in the presence of updates or in the presence of joins. So we can cheat massively. Still use these clever techniques. So I would imagine that a solar index, a Lucene index, 
would make an excellent input format for some of these because you can scan the posting vectors only. It's essentially columnar already in a very odd and cool way. And so we could scan that quite well. And we could use a lot of these techniques against tables like that. So, yeah, absolutely. We love cheating. Yeah, I, I always love that. But why, why do the hard stuff? Cheat. Yeah. Is drill going to support any sort of spatial search? Is drill going to support any sort of spatial search? Are you volunteering? <laughs> so I think that it's pretty straightforward to do different kinds of spatial search. Uh, there's a couple of different techniques. One is bounding boxes. Bounding boxes are just an abstraction over that. And so it would be very easy to put into the query processor uh, a few rules that say, if you see a geo search, then translate it this way. And since we can't do joins anyway, the geo searches have to be against constants. Yay, we win. Uh, and so that allows us then to hard code those in as multiple first bounding box and then radius calculations, uh, multiple handed predicates, just in a rewrite. It's also quite plausible that we would do the magic uh, multi-scale spot sort of encoding of large regions. Uh, and that, that the idea there is that you, for any arbitrary region, you find the largest spot, the spots that are included in that, and then you find the largest spots that are included in the residue after that with minimum overlap against the non things And then an object has references to these spots. And so you just have to look for the, the existence of the spots that may overlap with the region you're interested in. And again, that's very easy to encode in these columnar data formats. And very easy to rewrite on the fly to, to produce what you want. So yes and no. Uh, yes, if the community decides to do that, no, if they don't. But geo kind of guys like you, we'd love to have help with them. Mike? Um, in your first slide of uh, the, the sample SQL, yeah. uh, it looked like you had some extensibility. So you can extend the query language with your own functions. Or yeah, or uh, that clearly has to happen. User defined functions and extensibility claim clearly have to happen. That's, that was the question, by the way. Does that happen? So the answer is yes, that clearly has to happen. Exactly what the right mechanisms to do that are is an open question. For one thing, there's the question of security in general. And so we probably will not let quite as loosey-goosey a model happen as, say, pig or hive allow. Probably have a more security controlled registration process for UDFs and naming scheme for UDFs, just like we'd have naming schemes for protobuf schemas and things like that. Uh, essentially, the H catalog for code instead. Uh, but other than that, yeah, I think that extensibility has to happen. And it will happen on many levels. At the implementers, it will happen by people being able to add new operators at the high or low level. It'll be people be allowed to write new scanners or new file extensions. So this is kind of an implementer level of extensibility. And then at the pool, not quite the, the user level, but the site administrator, we would like to be able to add UDFs. And that's about the sophistication that people are at. They say, how about we get something running and talk about it? Most of the talks that we have had have talked about independent processes not running in the same memory space to which data will be fed in an abstract, bounded way. So we can sandbox those very thoroughly, feed data to them, they feed back results, and we're doing many columns anyway. So we're going to send all of the columns that this UDF wants to it, get all of its results, and then collate against the things, other things we need. So that's probably the style. Rather than, I mean, the, the, we were talking earlier about H-based coprocessors and the incredible nightmare that those raise because any programmer now has complete access to the complete memory image of H-based, including the ability to violate reflection and nitration hiding. And people do it. And the semantics are not clear, and you can completely rewrite all of the aspects of the, the, the thing. It's just a nightmare semantic. We really want to lock that down to here is what a UDF does, here's the data it gets, here's the output it's allowed to produce, and if it doesn't do that, we just cut it off. So we want to have a more secure environment than that. Okay. Wow. That's a lot of questions. Okay. I have one more. Okay. 
Uh, well, let's let Mr. Boris again uh, do this. So Boris again. Yeah, let's let him do it. It makes him so happy. See, he's smiling. Yeah. So one of the things in the article is the performance is achieved because of the clever data organization. And that's why they have their own folders that actually create this data layout. You, on another hand, are talking about processing of arbitrary JSON extraction, where you have no idea what the repetition count is, where it will occur. And yeah, you can try to do adaptive search, but it will make it so much more complex. So, I didn't hear a question, but he says that the big part <laughs> of the performance in Dremel well, was due to clever file organization. And yet, in and, and that's how they, that is indeed how they get most of their performance. They're very clever about file uh, layouts and very clever about predicate push down and late record assembly. Absolutely true. They introduce the columns if they need it. They're playing a lot of tricks. They're playing a lot of tricks, absolutely. Uh, on the other hand, we at Dremel, or Drill, would like to support simpler data structures as well. And nothing in the execution engine precludes that or makes that even complicated. In fact, it's much easier to do that than it is to do late record assembly and do the, the calls. So there's a combination of, it's very clear that some people will want to run against the original data without loading. Me, for one. So I, you know, if I have some sort of data in an Avro file or a protobops or a JSON and a, or, or log files, and I want to munch on it, using drill, I may just want to munch on it, maybe tiny, in which case the performance benefits are not that big. So if the performance benefits are x, 10x, 20x, 50x, whatever you want to say, there are many files that are 10x, 50x smaller than the big ones. And so for those, we can get acceptable performance without the clever tricks. And that seems like a very handy thing to do. Most files are small in the, in the universe. Uh, according to the last test across all of the universe that I did, but, uh, or at least my sample of it. Uh, that said, it is true that we have to do a loader of some kind in order to get high performance. <coughs> so we have to do that as well. But for the first Hello World version of Drill, probably it'll be CSV data or JSON, just to get all the pieces working together in the simplest possible way. That's that's the step that we want to take. Right. So basically, what you are saying is non-deterministic file structures can be used for initial tests, but the true executable and the terabytes of data would require a special file layout. Because without special file layout, you can't even achieve data locality. You okay. have no idea. Um, so he, he makes a couple of points. Yes, initially we'll do simple formats, but even later we'll do simple formats as well because lots of data is in simple formats, and so it's nice to be able to process that as well. Secondly, uh, you made the assertion that without fancy formats we can't achieve data locality. Actually, with JSON or BSON or, or Message Pack, any of these row-based formats or have row, we get data locality quite trivially because we're doing a single table scan. And so the locality, all the data is right there. We have to use cleverness to get data locality in a column-based world, actually, to get those columns to live on the same node. In, in, in MapR, you can do that by setting chunk size to zero. You can put as many files as you want, and they will stay on the same nodes, even all their replicas. Or you could do the Dremel trick if you pack all of the columns, kind of like a packs format. <coughs> so you take the chunks, row-wise chunks, and then for those chunks, you put columns in there. Now, none of this matters about determinism. We don't need to know what the total number of columns are to begin with. We just have to scan until we find the columns that are mentioned in the query. And until they're mentioned, if we need to throw those away, we throw those away. If we don't need to throw them away, we don't throw them away. But we only need to care about what's in the query and then what we eventually encounter in the file. We don't need to worry about the fact that we discover there's a new column after looking through 90% of the file. That's not a problem. 
So some of what you say I think is, is absolutely correct. We need the fast formats. Some of it I disagree with in that we don't need the fast formats always. We don't need it for data locality. And there's, there's useful work to be done on simple formats as well. So I think we'll do both. And we'll do it generally so it's easy to do both. Yeah, uh, John. So, and the, the, this is getting ahead of things, just, but it seems like it's going to be a natural one to start looking up tools, like BI, reporting tools, as a thought we're given to what kind of interface. Yeah, so he says that it's going to be a natural for BI. It's, it's absolutely a natural, and a lot of the BI vendors are already supporting Dremel as an API in the form of BigQuery. So if we maintain an exact URL equivalence API, one of those drivers being a BigQuery style API injection point, then we will accidentally pick up essentially all of the vendors. Uh, secondly, uh, some of the drill contributors are experts on SQL. Uh, and so there's an interesting possibility. One is that the BI tools allow you to enter Dremel syntax into an ODBC or JDBC driver, in which case you get results back, or they, uh, they drill itself accepts SQL syntax to the extent the data is simple enough to talk about it in SQL. And so then they just work through ODBC and JDBC. So I expect that there will be some very cool demos within a year from this and possibly within several months from these BI vendors. So yeah, the, the, those are several months from now. Yeah, that? yeah. I mean, we've already got big chunks of code that are ready to check in. The, the query parser, query optimizer, parts of the execution engine just need glue and, and a bit of sanding to, to make the syntax and the semantics work right. Uh, so you know, the, this big chunks already in play. Uh, not checked in yet because we're adopting them from existing projects. But yeah, there's big chunks. And so the, the, the hello world could happen very, very short term. And, and the big bang shortly after that, hopefully. Because the goal of the hello world is to define the interfaces in such a way that many people can work on every layer of the system. Yeah. Can you put an ETA on that world? It's open source. Give me a break. He asked for an ETA. Okay, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but this is always a good question to ask. When will this happen? And it's always good to answer. Nobody knows. Uh, certainly we'll push it. But there are other people who are showing astonishing level of uh, commitment to this. And so the, the amount of resources is probably 10x higher than we expected. We're, we're just stunned at the, at the adoption from the community. And we'd love to have more people involved as well. I know that there are companies that have pieces of this sort of thing internally. I would, I would love to see adoption by them as well and a broader community. That would be really, really cool to see. And, you know, even if it doesn't seem like it or doesn't seem uh, consonant with corporate goals, I think that the, the real thing is community here better than fracturing Byzantine or Malkin, I think a raisonization of, of this sort of community. I think we all win much, much more if we work together. So we want this to be a wide open community, subject to people actually contributing. So, yeah, sure. Based on your response, Boris, so I, I think I get what you're saying where if it's something like JSON and you have these sequence, so you, you might have the 90th row end up having some column that you didn't experience the first 90%. Who cares? Nobody queries on it. Why bother trying to cache it? So you're doing lazy caching of columns. If someone were to, write, were to type in a, a query that they just, you know, cap columns, whatever, they, they type out and they misnamed the, the column, would that lead to you caching a non existent column? If there's no schema, you can't validate the query. So, so the, the question is, what actually happens? I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase it short. What actually happens with places where you don't know that field even exists until you get way through the file? What happens if you mistype the query? What happens if you do mention the, the field correctly? Now, uh, I apologize, but if somebody mistypes a query, all bets are off. 
So yeah, that, that's an easy answer. I just wanted, wouldn't want it to break, right? Yeah, it will break if they mistype the query in the wrong way. Why would you want it to like edit caching some huge amount of data? Well, but the caching only occurs with data that exists. It's only caching columns that exist, and so if you mistype something to a column that never exists, you will get a null on every result you get for that field because it never exists. We don't know it doesn't exist if it's a schemaless data format, uh, and you'll just get a null for that. But we won't cache the nulls because null means not there. Man, that's easy to catch. No, not there. So that, that's easy. And likewise, if there is a field after 90% of the data comes along, and you did mention it in the query in, say, a predicate, the predicate could either be true or false if the field is missing. And it could be true or false if the field is there. But either way, we evaluate the predicate. If it's missing, we put in null and see what the value is. If it's there, we put in the value and see what the value is of the predicate. <coughs> Likewise, if it's in the select fields, one of the things you're projecting to, if it's not there, we put a null. If it is there, we put the value. That's not so bad. Now, if we have a schema, as you say, we can do better in that if somebody types a column or a, a nested name and it doesn't exist in the schema, we can say, you idiot. We can say that much earlier. If we don't have a schema, then we can never say, you idiot. We just give them back nulls. So with the CSV, you would have a schema, you would create a schema, but with failure. Yeah, with CSV, you would have a weak schema, and then you know the field names, but you do not know the types. With Avro, you have a much stronger schema, or Protobox, you have a stronger schema because you know the names and the types. So yeah. All right. This is quite a set of questions. <laughs> so that's all the questions we've got. We can do informal questions too. Yeah, but there's plenty of time still to uh, talk and network. And if everyone would uh, give a hand to Ted, thank you very much. <laughs>